Before we begin this episode, I would like to speak a little bit more about Christianity and about the conditions that existed in Judea when Jesus walked the earth. Um, there were, traditionally it was thought because of the writings of Josephus, he described three different groups, um, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. So traditionally it was thought that those were the three groups within Judaism. But since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s, um, there has been a rethinking of um, what, how many groups there actually was. If you start counting, you'll see there was the Samaritans. They were a kind of an offshoot of Judaism. There were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes, as Josephus described. And as the New Testament describes, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees. There was the followers of Jesus. There was the followers of John the Baptist. Um, and there's also who some say were Essenes and others say were not Essenes, were different than Essenes. So um, what, what the, the new scholarship, I guess you could call it, is saying that there were actually uh, a lot of different small groups um, that had slight different takes on the uh, Bible and the Word of God and the Dead Sea people. Now the Dead Sea, on the, these scrolls were found on the northwest coast of the Dead Sea is where the Qumran caves are and that there part between there and Jerusalem is the Judean desert so that's the desert where uh, John the Baptist wandered in um, that's the desert that likely that Jesus went to for 40 days and fasted um, that was the desert very associated with Jerusalem because it was right next to it almost. So the these Qumran people they had ritual baths and uh, they uh, lived there in the desert on the shores of the Dead Sea like on the basically on the cliffs at the tops of the cliffs and looking over the Dead Sea. And they are the ones who uh, um, buried or, or put all these scrolls into vessels, clay vessels in the caves. And there was a whole society there built upon these certain scrolls. And they also found that there was other books um, besides the Tanakh. Now the Tanakh is to the best of our knowledge, the Tanakh was the um, the scrolls that were kept in the temple, per perhaps uh, considered by the Pharisees as the holy scrolls, and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin council, perhaps the Tanakh was the scrolls that they they recognized. But then there are other books that were circulating that were considered holy by other people. For example, the apostles, uh, the apostle uh, Peter and James. Um, don't quote me on that. But there's a couple of apostles that quote the book of Enoch. So that was considered a scripture 
by the some of the apostles at least. Jesus, um, he continually uh, talks about the Son of Man, himself as being the Son of Man. And the book of Enoch contains massive prophecies about the Son of Man. And the book of Enoch was well known to at least these two apostles. So at least these two apostles can completely associated Jesus with the Son of Man of the book of Enoch, uh, which is a heavenly being. Um, so likely all of the apostles and Jesus can, can, uh, attributed the book of Enoch's Son of Man prophecies to Jesus. Um, there are other books as well. There's a book of Barak. There's other Gospels or not Gospels, but other writings for, of uh, that claim to be inspired writings in Hebrew and, and in Aramaic and uh, that are called uh, maybe uh, extra biblical Jewish literature. So a lot of this literature was considered holy by people that were not in the Sanhedrin and not in those schools of thought. So there's um, it, it's like a new way of looking at things that um, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, they had probably the Tanakh. And they had a very strict um, um, religion of following only what's in these books and following it perfectly, and especially the Torah. So, uh, which is very much a, a forerunner to rabbinic Judaism that we see today. So, the point is that there were other schools of thought out there, including Jesus, including the Samaritans, including um, uh, disciples of John, including the people of Qumran. So we're seeing um, there was a variety of teachings which all had common things, but perhaps disagreed on some other things and including disagreeing on some books. So um, now this sort of gives a new light to some scriptures in the New Testament. For example, when Paul says in 2 Timothy, chapter 3, Verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou has learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou has learned them, and that from a child thou has known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So now, what does he mean when he says all scripture? Is he talking about the book of Enoch? Is, is he talking about only the Tanakh? Is he talking about maybe all of it? Maybe everything. Everything the Qumran people had. Everything that was out there. Everything that, w that was related is there in order for f to be profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So maybe uh, part of that can be um, discerning what is what is from God and what is not from God. 
And part of that is to say, well, um, this is teaching, it may be not exactly scripture, but it's teaching something good about scripture. There's commentaries, there's other writings, and that even if you say, well, I don't really agree with this, that's still part of your instruction, and it's still part of your growing in righteousness to be exposed to many different um, things. Instead of having everything already spoon-fed to you, already laid out to you, that read this and only this and only listen to this, that, that was put there by these other people. You should have your mind uh, on, and looking at all these things to um, arrive at the truth. And um, it's the same thing with the ministry of Jesus. The Jesus came, he didn't necessarily agree with the scriptures of the Pharisees. He, is, he disagreed with their interpretation of it. So um, if we look at a prophecy here that comes to mind to me in Isaiah chapter 42, I know the rabbis will disagree with me that this is talking about Jesus, but Christians agree that it is about Jesus. Uh, we'll start in verse 1. Behold my servant who I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry out or lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he shall not break, and the smoking flax he shall not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail or be discouraged till he has set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. The isles is the Gentiles. Um, it's in the Hebrew scriptures, the Isles is often associated with Japheth, which is the Gentiles, the Greeks. So, um, and in chapter 42, if you look uh, in verse 21, the Lord is well pleased. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Now, <clears throat> so to a Christian, this is the new covenant, which comes with a new law, which is completely based upon the old law as a foundation. So what is this new law coming that's coming from Jesus? It comes in the form of parables. Um, he didn't lay out Jesus' new Ten Commandments. He, he laid out all these parables, and parables that you would apply to uh, an understanding of the law and the, the Torah, and parables that you could also apply to your life, and that it was something beyond the writings in a book. It was something that um, almost has a life itself that this this a very dynamic understanding of these parables and understanding the Torah and understanding the prophets and bringing all of that together into something greater than the sum of its parts so that is the law the law of Jesus the that is the gospel um, now it's not it's not about you know listening to certain teachers reading certain books and laying out certain laws it's it's about having God in your life having God in your heart and being led by God through life which is a living experience rather than 
an institution with teachers, with books, with, with a, a written set of rules. So there's the difference between maybe rabbinic Judaism and Christian thought is there's this um, expansion, this magnification of the Torah and the prophets, um, and this magnified understanding. So with that being said, uh, the rabbi brings up these three different um, points about Christian scripture, and I will go through each one of them, but with this understanding that we're not just, you know, parsing words is not really the Christian way to go about things, but you can do it. You still can do it, and it does make sense, but it's a little bit more dynamic than, you know, using a stick to point to the word and reading it, um, you know, as, um, you know, parsing out these words written on a book. It, it's more of a living thing. Okay, so his first um, thing he talks about is angels. The New Testament says in three different places that the Torah was given to us through angels. In Acts chapter 7, verse 53, you received the law as ordained by angels. In Galatians 3, 19, it said that the Torah was added because of transgressions. It was ordained through angels. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2, for the word was spoken through angels. Now, is that how we got our Torah? We don't find in our scriptures that it was coming to us through angels we're told it was revealed to us directly by God to Moses. There were no angels in the process. Number six, if you were here last December 24th or 5th, we had an entire day seminar devoted to this passage in the book of Matthew, quoting a verse in Isaiah, the famous passage of the virgin birth. We see here how Isaiah is basically mangled by the New Testament Essentially, the problem is a one of mistranslation. Isaiah speaks about a young girl, and the New Testament translates it into a virgin. Uh, there are many other problems, but again, it's a classical problem from the Christian Bible trying to uh, enlist the Old Testament improperly. Number seven, the book of James chapter four, or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy, there is no such verse anywhere in the Jewish Bible. You'll often find the Christian Bible inventing verses that don't exist at all. <clears throat> Number eight, the Christian Bible in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, therefore when he came into the world he said, and don't forget when I put it into italics, it's quoting from the Hebrew Bible. When he came into the world he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. When you study that verse in the Hebrew Bible, Psalm chapter 40, it mentions nothing in the Hebrew Bible about a body being prepared. All right. This here is called the blueletterbible.org. Blue Bible.org. So this is a pretty good tool for learning uh, Hebrew and and Greek and digging into the scriptures a little bit deeper. Now he talks about angels. Um, first thing we need to learn is what is an angel or what does angel mean? Um, the uh, the word for, the Hebrew word for angel is malak. Malach. Okay? And here it is right here. Malach. So, this is uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak. So, Vayavo 
Mar Ak Adonai, that's the tetragrammon. Va Yeshev. So I'm not going to dig into the Hebrew too much here, but there's the word Mal Ak. So now in the blue letter, blue letter Bible, we can scroll down here. You can go to each word. And there came an angel of the Lord. Okay? So now you click on this here. And it brings up that word, Malak. That's this is the translation, an angel. It's uh, the root is Malak. It is a noun. Okay, we'll click on this Strong's number here. Brings us to this page here. Okay, Malak. What does it mean? It means a messenger. A messenger, an angel, a representative, the theophanic angel. Um, it's from an unused root, meaning to dispatch as a deputy, a messenger, specifically of God, also a prophet, a priest, or a teacher, an ambassador. Um, okay, now if we scroll down further, there's there's the Brown Driver Briggs definition of it and uh, messenger that's all it says okay um, if we go down to Jesenius he has a lexicon and there is Malak one cent a messenger whether from a private person or of a king okay now <clears throat> here's the real tell is okay how is this this is different Bible verses where this word is being used, okay? And in Genesis 16, an angel of the Lord found her by the fountain of the water in the wilderness. That's Hagar, right? Um, Genesis 16:10, uh, the angel, the angel, the angels. So it's going to be angel all through Genesis, okay? But if you go up into numbers okay Israel sent messengers unto Sion king of the Amorites Israel sent messengers now did Israel send angels let's see now if I hear this verse example you click on tools and it'll take it apart okay it brings us to this spot here right that's this verse here, and Israel sent messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites. So here it is. This is it breaking down. And Israel sent messengers, Malachim. So that im on the end, that's a plural. It's like an S in English. So it's the same word. So you click here, root word, Malach. Um, with an im on the end because it's a plural. It's the same word as angel. So if you, if it's a man sending it, then it's an, it, then it's a messenger. If it's a king sending the person, it's a messenger. If it's God sending someone, then it's an angel. But it's the exact same word in Hebrew. Malach. It's a messenger. That's what you've heard it said that an angel is a messenger. It is a messenger. That's all that's what it means. There's no in the word itself, Malach, there is no idea of a bright shiny being with wings. There is no it's just a messenger. But it's of the Lord that that would tell you it's an angel, a messenger of the Lord, or sometimes the messenger of the Lord. And that is, um, it doesn't even necessarily mean an angel, but it means a messenger sent by God, which could be a prophet, it could be a teacher, 
I'm a messenger of the Lord. You see, it's it's a malak is a messenger. So it's just a, a translation thing where if God does it, they translate it as one thing, and if somebody else does it, they translate it as something else. But it's the exact same word. Okay? So now uh, let's take a look at the scriptures that uh, we might as well use a blue letter Bible here. So you hit this thing here. We're going to take a look at Acts chapter 7, verse 53. So we go here, click on that. And you can go anywhere in the Bible. We'll check out Acts chapter 7. Boom. Scroll down, verse 53. Who have received the law by disposition of angels and have not kept it. Okay? So which the prophets, which prophets have, this is Stephen talking, okay, to the Jews and before they put him to death. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers of. So he's saying Jesus was the just one who you have now murders. And who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So what does that mean, angels? Okay, in the Greek, boom, angels. Angels. What word is this? Angelos. Okay, there's the root, angelos. Um, Strong's number, G32, okay. What does it mean? Angel, messenger, seven times. Oh, so it also means angel, 179 times. Messenger, seven times. A messenger. This is in the Greek, okay? A messenger, an envoy, one who is sent, an angel. Um, so it's a, it's also a messenger, but it's not always from God. Um, let's see. For this is he who this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger. Okay. Where's another one? I don't know if the Greek really um, uses that word as, as just a messenger. Um, we might find it more past the Gospels. Let's see, Luke. Yeah, it doesn't, oh, there it is, okay. Let's um, look here. From Hebrews to Revelation, okay, um, there it is, okay. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works? This is James 2.25. When she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. So this is the spies that went into Jericho. Okay, and Rahab the harlot let them down outside the wall and help them. So these are not angels. Okay, so G32. What word is this? Anglos, the messengers. So it's the same in Greek. It can be, it means a messenger. It's just if it's God, then they, then they call it an angel. But if it's a man, they call it a messenger. You see, it, it depends on who sent it. But it's the exact same word, Anglos. It's a messenger. So now 
let's go look at the other scriptures that he um, talked about. Galatians 3.19. I've got to go back a few, get back to this thing. Galatians 3.19. What then serves the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Okay. Ordained by messengers. Okay. Um, now, what messengers? Um, maybe he's not talking only about Moses. Moses is a messenger of God. Okay. But there, the, the law was ordained, the Torah was ordained by many messengers. There's uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the angels that appeared to them. The uh, There's Moses, there's Joseph, there's... These are all messengers of God. So, you know, when you start parsing these words, what does he actually mean when it's, was it was ordained by Anglos in the hand of a mediator? Okay, um, by messengers in the hand of a mediator. The mediator is Moses. So there's messengers sent by Moses. You see? Um, it was ordained by messengers sent from Moses. So there's there's nothing really like wrong about that. A mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Because when you have a mediator, then you have three. There's a mediator between two people, right? So, you know, you also have to look at what is he talking about? What's the context he's using here? So, you know, to say uh, it was ordained by angels or ordained by messengers, maybe messengers would be a better translation, is what I'm saying. Okay, let's. Uh, there's one more verse he pointed out, Hebrews two two. Let's take a look at that one. Hebrews. Hebrews two. Two. For the word spoken by angels, spoken by messengers, okay, he could be talking about the prophets. The prophets were also messengers, okay? For the word spoken by messengers was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was c confirmed to us by them that heard him. So it's better messengers of a better message. So a uh, greater um, expectation, right? So uh, it's the same thing. It's the, the messengers are the prophets. It's... It's just the translation translated to angels because they're assuming that they came straight from God. But the prophets, if you think about it, are directly bringing a message directly from God also. So they're also angels, if you want to. But, but since it's not something with wings that flies around, then it's a, a messenger. Right? So you want to parse words, then there's there's where we are, okay? Uh, now he also talked about the virgin birth. Okay, virgin birth. And that is found, Isaiah 7, 14. So let's go. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. 
What's a sign? Is a sign is uh, something that is going to prove something, right? I'm going to give you a sign. That's that's a sign is something outside of nature that is going to show that God is involved. This is a sign. Behold, what's going on here? Something wrong with my mouse here. Hang on, I know what it is. There, I gotta click it. What the? Sorry about that. Where are we? 14. Okay. Tools. Let's like let's take a look at this. The Lord will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin. What is the word? Ha alma. Now the ha, that's a definite article. The ha part, that's a definite article. So um, the alma. Okay, so what's an alma? This is what they say is a virgin, right? Go here. Alma is the root word. Ha, see, ha is separate because that's the. The Alma will give birth. Check out Strong's number here. What's an Alma? A maiden. Oh, newly married. Marriageable age. Young woman. A virgin. Okay, so it's it's a it's a, a female that is no longer a child but not yet a woman okay um, there is no instance where it can be proved that Alma designates a young woman who is not a virgin the fact of virginity is obvious it's it's a newly married uh, damsel it's a, a young woman a young girl a young female who is no longer a child but not yet a woman okay so let's take a look at some examples of where this is used you can see the brown driver Briggs young woman okay you can see uh, Jacinius a girl of marriageable age okay and then you can see some examples here uh, where this word Alma is used in the scriptures. Behold, okay, this is Genesis when the, the servant of Abraham went to find a wife for Isaac, right? Behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the Alma comes to draw water, and I say to her, give me, pray, a little water, to drink that she will also feed my camels right so the Pharaoh's daughter said to her go and the what the heck is going on and the okay and the Elma went and called the child's mother. That's when they saw Moses in the river in the basket. So the Pharaoh's daughter sent her maiden, her her Alma, her uh, dam damsels. The singers, Psalm 68, the singers went before the players on instruments, followed after. Among them were the Alma playing with timbrels. Proverbs, right? Uh, three, three things I do not know, or four things I cannot tell. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with an alma. Young maiden. Okay. Um, songs of Song of Songs, right? Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do almas love thee. 
they all want to marry him, right? They're, they're the young maidens. Okay. There are three score queens and four score con concubines. So the queens are wives of the king. Concubines are concubines of the king. And Alma without number. Who are the Alma? They're the young maidens who want to be a concubine or a queen. You see? Um, then in Isaiah, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, an Alma shall conceive. Um, now I have a book here. Uh, it's called, uh, written by William L. Holliday. And it's a concise Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament. And um, he, uh, this is like a go-to book for Hebrew scholars to find out the meaning of Hebrew words in the Bible. And what he says about Alma is a girl of marriageable age, a young woman, until the birth of the first child. Um, so, presumably a virgin. Okay? Presumably. And the Alma, the virgin, shall be conceive. That will be her first child. Presumably her first conception. You see? So, virgin is a valid word to use. Um, it's not exactly saying virgin, but it's in our culture. If you say a young woman, boy, that doesn't say virgin, does it? You know, it's like in that culture, most likely, most definitely a virgin. So, that's why it's translated as virgin. It, a maiden, a damsel, a, a, a lady in waiting. That's, that's what it means. And, and for further proof of this, we can go here, okay, with the Strong's Numbers. Go down here. Strong's Number. Uh, if you can find it again here. There it is. Word search. You can go to the next Strong's Number or the previous. We'll go here, boom. So Alma, if we look at the word Alma, it's the ah uh on the end. That ah. Uh, that is a feminine ending. So that makes it, a, it's alam, is a masculine word. And the ah uh on the end makes it a feminine word. So Alma is a female who is ripe for marriage. Okay? Now if we go this way, one on Strong's Numbers, what's it? It's LM. It's, it's the same word, but it's the masculine form. If it had the AH on the end, it's a feminine, right? Okay, so LM. What's an LM? It is a young lad. I'm, I'm a young man, a stripling, um, a youth, a young man of the age of puberty. Okay? There's, it's used twice in the Bible here. And the king said, inquire to those whose son the young man is. I think he was talking about David, right? Uh, the other one, also about David, probably. But if I say this to the young man, Behold, the arrows are beyond me. Go thy way. That's David and Jonathan. But that's what it means. It means a, 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 a boy who's no longer a boy, but he's not quite a man. He's in that transition time between a boy and a man. So that's an LM. And an Alma is a, is a female who's in that transition time between a girl and a woman. So presumably a virgin.
when it's a girl. Also a boy. Presumably he's a virgin also. And because it's it's the, the sexual conduct that, that makes him a man or, or that makes the girl a woman. Um, in some cases, like say Sarah, Abraham's wife, who didn't uh, conceive until she was a hundred years old, um, she was still considered a woman, but she considered her virginity as her reproach, as her uh, her um, uh, disgrace. So it, she considered it a disgrace because she had not given her husband a child. But, you know, her age alone made her a woman. And her marry, being married made her a woman. Uh, and, but she was, and she was trying to conceive, but had not yet conceived. So just being sexually active, I suppose, is what makes you no longer Alma but a woman and, and not only a woman but somebody's wife uh, presumably okay so virgin is a good uh, translation really okay now inventing verses okay um, he also brought up Hebrews Chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. This one's an interesting one, actually. Let's take a look at it. I'm going to go back here. There, until we get that thing. Then we go here. Hebrews 10. Where is Hebrews? There it is. Hebrews 10, verse 5. Okay. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body has thou prepared me. Okay, so this is where he's contending, saying, in the Hebrew, it doesn't say a body. Okay, let's go back to the Hebrew, first of all, and take a look at that. It's in Psalm chapter 40, verse 7. So let's take a look. Psalm chapter 40, verse 7. It said, Lo, I oh know, verse 6 actually, sacrifice and offering thou did not desire, my ears has thou opened. So let's um, take a look at taking this apart in the Hebrew. Okay. Zava, sacrifice. Uman ha, and offering. Not, you did not desire. Okay. Let's go down here. You did not desire azanim. That is ears. Okay? Azanim, ears. Because the im is a plural ending. So azan is ear. Azanim, ears. Karata. Now that ta on the end, that means you. So Kara is he called out, uh, called. You called in ears to me. So you in in my ears you called to me. And then that goes on Ola, which is whole burnt offering. Right? Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Okay? So what it really says here is um, that sacrificing, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. In my ears you have called to me. 
That's that's what it says, okay? And burnt offering and sinner offering you have not required. And then it says in the volume of the book it is written of me. Okay, so now why does Hebrews change that from in my ears you have called to me. My ears you have opened, it says, but it really it means my ears through my ears you have called to me. This is a physical thing, right? It's in physically you have called to me in my ears. So now let's go back to Hebrews ten. Hebrews ten verse five and six. Okay, so now here's here's something I wanna point out that in the Hebrew language, very often they use um, words, uh, they play on words, like Adam was, Adam was created from the dust of the earth, and God breathed into him the, the life, and Adama is earth, or land, Adam is his name. So there's a play on words there. Adam is made from Adama. Um, the, another one is um, where, where did I find that? Oh, that's right too. It was in the book of Isaiah. Let's just take a look here as an example of um, a play on words in Hebrew. Isaiah chapter 7. Verse 9. Okay. So the head this second part of the verse here, if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. So let's take a look at that and say, okay, and it says, this is if, im means if, lo, it means not, if not, okay, if not, ta'aminu, ta'aminu, that means if you will not believe, if you will believe, but the low says not, okay? So if you will not believe, ki low, then you will not te amanu. So see these two words look the same? Ta aminu, ta aminu. Te amenu. Ta aminu te amenu. So if you will not ta amenu, then you will not te aminu. So it's the same word being inflected in a different way, you see? So if we look at this word and the root of it, aman, okay? What does it mean? A primitive root to believe, assurance, faithful, to be established, to trust. Okay? So it's support, trust, uh, pillars, um, established, made firm, confirmed, stand firm, believe. You see, it's all these words in different forms of it. These are the forms of it and what it can mean. Okay? So it's playing on this word aman saying if you don't believe you will not be established. Um, if you don't exercise that thing you will not re 
reap the benefits of that thing. You see? So in believing, you reap the benefit you re re reap by believing is to be established in truth and to stand firm. You see? So there's the play on a word, on a Hebrew word. And, the, and it's like very, very common in the Hebrew scriptures, these, these word plays. There, there are a, a lot of them. So I wanted to make that point to show you something in the book of Hebrews. So we'll go back to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 5 and 6, but first take a look here, okay? Start, starting in verse 1 of Hebrews 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, but not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers perfect. So, it's only a shadow of things, not the actual things. The law, um, in, if you want to study Hebrews 9 and get into the whole context of what he's talking about, but this is the point he's making, that the law is a shadow of good things to come. It's like a prophecy, right? But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, where Jesus is the one sacrifice for all time, is what he gets into, right? Now, he says, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body has thou prepared me. So why has he changed that? It's like, in the in the in the psalm it says you have spoken into my ears so he's still using there there's this physical sense to it right but what what is it why did he use this phrase here why did he translate it in this way we'll take it apart a bit and take a look at sacrifice and offering not but a body Let's see, what's this word here? A body in the Greek. A body you have prepared for me. So it's Strong's. And what's the word? Soma. Soma. What does the word Soma mean? It means a body of men or animals, a dead body or a living body, a body of the planet, a star, heavenly bodies, a uh, large or small number of men, a body of men, right? Uh, in the New Testament church, it, sometimes it refers to the body of the church, the body of Christ, okay? And what's the fourth? That which casts a, sh a shadow as distinguished from the shadow itself. So what was he saying in verse 1? He was saying the law is a shadow <clears throat> of things that are coming. And then he says, but now Jesus is that body which casts the shadow. You see? He's the body that the shadow is of. That's what he's saying. By, by using the language, you see... Paul is, I believe it's Paul in, that wrote the Hebrews. He's using a, a, a great leeway here in, in quoting the scripture, right? And, but, and he's making a point to Hebrews who would be reading this, Hebrews who know this scripture, okay? When he comes into the world, he says... When Jesus comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you would not want, but a body, uh, that which casts the shadow, you have prepared for me. You see, so he, he's, he's doing this play on words, which a Hebrew understands. 
So in verse 1, the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and Jesus having the body that cast the shadow, and not the shadow itself. Because that's the very point he's making in this whole, par this whole paragraph. So hopefully you can get that part. It, it's pretty interesting. And, and, and the fact that um, the apostles do, especially Paul, they do use uh, quite a lot of freedom in, in expressing the scriptures and interpreting the scriptures. And uh, there's a very good example of that. And it's not that Paul's trying to replace the um, Psalms. He's expanding on the understanding of it and saying, this is what it means. It's, it's, you have spoken directly into my ears. You have called me in my ears. So it, it's a very physical statement. So he's saying, this is the body that casts the shadow. So he's just using great freedom of speech, I think. Anyway. So there's that. And then um, the, the rabbi also talked about uh, James chapter 4, verse 5. That is a difficult one. We'll just take a look at what it says here. James chapter 4, verse 5. Uh, Do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy? Now, <clears throat> you're going to have a hard time finding that scripture in the Bible. And James is um, uh, talking about the book of Job uh, in this paragraph. So he might be quoting Job there because Job is uh, very, very complicated. Um, there's some very difficult to translate verses in Job. Um, so if... I knew the book of Job very well in Hebrew, which I don't. I might be able to pick out a verse that actually could be translated in that way. Um, but I don't know enough about that to be able to say. It may be quoting Job, the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy. Um, but... I don't know. Um, he could be talking about another book that is not in the Tanakh, like uh, the Book of Enoch or some other book, like some of the books that the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls have or some other um, extra-biblical Hebrew books that were uh, circulating at that time. It may be in one of those books. So I couldn't tell you where that actually comes from. But the idea, the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy, that idea can be found in the Torah. Like um, Joseph's brothers envied him. Uh, you know, there's a perfect, perfect example. The spirit in us that dwells in humans lusts to envy. It's, it's, it's easily turns to envy. So that concept is in the Torah, but the, that actual verse is a difficult thing to find. Um, maybe I'll figure that out at some other time in the future, but right now I, I couldn't uh, figure that out. So uh, thank you for listening, and we will see you again next week. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hit that like button. Help me out. Thank you very much.